Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome back. This is uh, PyTorch 2.0 live q and I'm your host, Justin, and I'm here today with uh, Kevin and Urja. How are you guys doing? I'm doing great. Um, hi, everyone. Hi, I'm Kevin. Um, I'm a software engineer working on PyTorch, Torch Data, and Urja. Yeah. Hi, everyone. I'm Urja, and I'm a software engineer uh, in Meta. I have been working on Torch Data for two years. Yeah. Okay. Justin, yeah, we saw your tweet um, about this talk. Where where, where are you? <laughs> yeah. So those of uh, those of you who are following me on Twitter, uh, my Twitter handle is at Sleepy Developer, and uh, the um, that video was taken to promote this uh, talk uh, in my backyard in front of uh, my uh, my firewood that I've been splitting. So <laughs> I had to pull down a couple trees because they were in danger of of falling over and possibly hurting somebody or damaging somebody's house. So. Um, making the most of the situation and, and you know, turning the, the tree that I had to take out um, into firewood. So <laughs> right. um, it's kind of a cathartic thing to do, just sit there and, and uh, you kind of have to look and see, you know, where, where the cracks are um, and, you know, aim for those because that makes it easier to split. So yeah, um, cool nonetheless. Well, you know, I was wondering, like, it'd be kind of interesting if you could, like, use some torch vision or something to, like, analyze the top of uh, of a log and see, like, where the best optimal place would be to strike the log to have it split. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure it will work in like 20 years or something. <laughs> see, these these are things I think of when I'm when I'm working on chores and stuff. Like, how can I use technology to do the things better that I'm doing? So, <laughs> all right. So with that. Um, uh, so just want to, uh, give everyone, you know, those, thank you for those of you who are continuing to tune in and have seen some of our past, uh, episodes. Those of you who are tuning in for the first time, just want to give you some context. Uh, this is one, this is not a one and done event. Um, these, this series is based upon and coincides with, uh, the announcement of PyTorch 2.0, which, uh, took place in, uh, December of last year. Um, and so th for those of you who are interested in playing with PyTorch and getting your hands dirty, um, it's not officially released yet, but it is available in the nightly builds. So if you go to uh, PyTorch.org and on the main page, you can see how to install the nightlies. And when you do so, you'll have access to uh, PyTorch 2.0. Uh, so uh, again, I'm really happy to have Kevin and Urja on today. They're going to be talking about uh, Torch data um, and the changes that uh, came to it based on uh PyTorch 2.0. We're specifically going to be talking about data pipes and data loader 2. And uh, what's really cool about the updates uh, for 2.0 is that Torch Data now provides a flexible and reusable building block or set of building blocks that allow you to create your data pipeline from scratch uh, very quickly and without rewriting commonly used code. So, um, you know, Kevin, uh, you know, um, I think. Uh, it's time for you to, to take the reins and yeah. dive a little deeper into, into the data pipes. And, and uh, for those of you who are following along as uh, they talk and share about different things, you know, feel free, you know, this is a live Q and A. So feel free to drop your question in the chat and uh, I will find an opportunity to, um, you know, butt in and, and, and ask on your behalf. So um, yeah, Kevin, take it away. Thank you, Justin. We'll start off today with a presentation of the Torch Data Library. First, uh, we're going to give an overview and explain what is the motivation behind creating this library. After that, we'll talk about some major components within this library, notably data pipes and data loader two. Then we're going to present a demo to showcase how our library works. And then finally, we'll talk about the future plans for our li library um, feel free to ask questions throughout the presentation, as Justin mentioned, but we will also have dedicated Q&A time at the end. Torch Data Library. Uh, so one of the main motivation behind this library is that we would like to improve the API and data loading experience for our user. The existing implementation of data loader is overloaded with too many parameters and options in one single place. As you can see on this screenshot we have, this is all the parameters that is, are currently available for data loader. 
And these parameters do widely different things, and they are not always closely related to each other. For example, we have shuffling and batching options, which are transformations. They are mixed together with num workers, persistent, persistent workers option, which are for executing data loading in parallel. So you can see a lot of these options, they do really different things and they don't really belong together. And our solution is to decouple these different types of logic from data loader and refactor some of these functionality into what we will call data pipes. For example, shuffling and batching will now become data pipe. In addition, we want to provide a better support for streaming solutions of data loading. We are going to place more emphasis on iterator style data sets. Another motivation is for us to provide a better distributed training experience. Right now, for a lot of distributed training, manual sharding is necessary. Users need to rewrite code every single time in order to divide up work among different workers and nodes. We think this is overall not a good user experience as you, uh, you have to redefine things over and over again every time you create a new data loader. So our solutions to this is provide a sharding up as a data pipe and in, integrated with data loader, this data pipe is going to perform automatic and dynamic sharding. We'll talk more about this later. Yeah, so Another basically, yeah. oh, sorry. So basically what you're saying here is like, uh, prior to two, uh, to the release of 2.0, um, you know, manual sharding was necessary. And so um, now manual sharding is no longer necessary based upon the solution that you're presenting here. So just want to call out that, you know, manual sharding was what it was before, and now you don't have to have that manual sharding. So just, just to be clear that what this, the, the value that this adds for 2.0. And another solution that we have is we want to make either data pipe a first class citizen with its streaming patterns. Uh, previously, there was not good support for distributed training with iterable style data set. And with Torch data, we will provide that. We think iterable data pipe has a few advantages. Notably, it's more suitable for streaming and processing massive data sets that cannot be stored in memory especially in some cases when not even the list of file descriptor can fit in memory. We see this trend today of bigger and better data sets and the need of streaming solutions, and we would like to tackle that. We also think that most operations can be equivalently well done in iterator styles versus map styles. So there shouldn't be any losses of functionality by converting some data set to iterator style. Uh, a third motivation that we have behind creating the Torch data library is because of an existing limitation behind um, of the current data loader. The existing design and implementation of data loader, workers' processes cannot pass messages back to the main process. This is more internal facing for our PyTorch developer than uh, external facing, but it has some negative implications. For example, exceptions in worker process cannot be propagated back to the main process. So if you have an exception raised in a worker, the main process doesn't always know or like what exception and can show the proper error message to the user. Another negative implication is that it prevents us PyTorch developers from implementing more new features that user would want. As a solution to that, we, we architecting data loader internals in data loader two, we add some communication infrastructure to pass messages back and forth between workers and the main process. This creates points of extensions and unblock us from building new features such as checkpointing and some advanced random, randomness control features. Now we'll take a look at some major components of the library starting with data pipe. A data pipeline can be described as a series of steps that your program executes in order to prepare your samples for training or inference. These steps can be seen as a graph, more specifically a direct acyclic graph, like the illustrations that we have here, where each node on the graph represents a transformation step. 
So based on this idea in Torch Data, we introduce composable and reusable building blocks that is called data pipes in Torch Data. Each data pipe perform a small transformation. It might be opening file, mapping a function, filtering, shuffling, batching, before handing off the output to the next data pipe. We think that by providing these composable and reusable building blocks, it will simplify the process of building new data pipeline as well as like transitioning from research to production. We have two types of data pipes in Torch data. One is either data pipe is in iterator style. It corresponds to either iterable data set in PyTorch. It follows the iterators pattern and it's going to be the preferred data pipe data set going forward. And then second, we have map data pipe, which follows the maps style, which corresponds to data set. It has random access via indices. Um, so a custom for it will users will be asked to implement and get item as you do in data set. Here are some examples of the building data pipes that we provide. Um, some perform very common transformation, for example, map, fork, filter, shuffle, batch, and random split. Other data pipes can interact with specific file types or file system that people will commonly do with while loading data. Um, for example, you can load CS3 file, you can parse JSON files, you can list out files on this file system, open them. We also have good integration with cloud storage providers such as AWS S3, Google Cloud, and Azure. And right here we have data pipes to list out files on any S3 buckets and load them. We also have API to read from other vendors such as Hugging Face. Overall, we have about 70 built-in either data pipes and map data pipes. We have intentional design for both operations to be executed in iterator style without any loss of functionality compared to map style, because we believe iterator style can cover pretty much all the use cases. But if you really want a map data, data pipe for random access to any individual elements, we also provide a built-in converter that you can use to convert a map data pipe from a either data pipe. Here's an example of what a data pipeline would look like using built-in data pipes. Uh, you start off by listing out files on your file system. Maybe you filter them and shuffle them and you shard them. Note that we have a sharding filter data pipe here. This is going to be the starting point at which each worker will process different samples if you're using multiple workers or nodes. We'll talk more about this in detail later. Here's another example of a data pipeline. And this one is different in that it has multiple mod modalities, meaning there are like different types of data. Some might be images, some might be text, some can be video. So we're demonstrating that you can split your data up, processing differently, and perhaps convert them back to tensor later, then combine that together as a final output that you can use for training of your model. Here's what a data pipe would look like in code. In this example, we list up some files, we shuffle them, we shard them, then we open and decode them. Notice that we have two data pipelines here, but the only thing really different about them is like that they are interacting with different file system. The first one is working with local file system. So we have a data pipe called file lister to list out all the files locally. The second one, we are working with an S3 bucket and then we have a different data pipe to interact with that. But overall, the other operations can still remain the same. You can still use shuffling, sharding and other functionalities, but you only need to swap out specific data pipe when you're interacting with different file systems. It is also create, possible to create custom data pipe if all the built-in ones do not have what you need. In this case, let's say we want to perform some custom operation after decoding the file, we can do so by creating our custom data pipe and use it. Um, you can also provide a functional method to your data pipe so that you can just do dot custom operation and apply on any existing data pipe. Now I'll pass it to Urja to talk about data loaded too. Yeah, hi everyone, I'm Urja. 
thanks Kevin for the introduction on data pipe. So now we have a concept of graph of data pipes. So it's about now it's about how to load data from this graph. So that's why we are proposing data order two, which is a new data front end API for our users. It will provide the most of the uh, user facing APIs like iterating the graph, yielding data, resetting random states. And in the future, we might also want to provide more user facing APIs such as multi phase reading and checkpointing over data loader two. So, uh, so in, in order to help, the, so when we have a graph of data pipe, in order to help data loader two to understand how to execute this data pipe graph, we introduce another component. We call it reading service. Uh, it's kind of like a backend executor, which will do all the graph rewrite and configuration setting. So basically, it will, this this reading service will basically help you do all the sharding par parallelism automatically. Right? So we will talk more detail on this topic in in the next few slides. And I, I just want to call another fact, you can always write your own customized reading service as a new backend executor to optimize the data pipe graph. Uh, so we please check the link I attached to this slide for the all the required interface you need to write to do the graph rewrite. So the last uh, the last component we we, are, uh, we propose for data loader two is adapter. So it's kind of like similar to reading service in terms of graph rewrite and configuration setting. But the difference is like for users who want to reuse the pipeline, let's say, for example, uh, currently Torch Tax has provided tons of data set based on Torch data. So you want to kind of like do some in-place modification over the torch, torch text provided data set. You can always do like use a shuffle disabler or shuffle enabler to make sure the pipeline is, uh, is enabled with shuffle or disabled with shuffle, all the shuffling operations. So basically this adapter uh, instance will go through the graph and disable or enable the, all the shuffle operations within the data pipe graph. Okay, let's do a quick recap on those components. First, data loader two is gonna be a user facing API for data loading. And the, the first argument of data loader two is data pipe, which, which as Kevin talked about, it's gonna be a data pipe graph, with a pipeline of all different data transformation operations. And the second argument for data loader two is reading service which is kind of like a backend executor to help data loader two to modify and execute the data pipe graph based on their uh, specific use cases. The third one is adapter. Adapter is the one to, it, it's, a option, it's a, an optional argument and it will help graph rewrite and configure a setting. So next slide please. Uh, we have talked a lot about sharding and determinism in the previous slides. I want to call a few facts that like data loader one, kind of like uh, how data loader one interact with sharding and determinism. So when you have a maxed out data set with data loader one, in order to achieve sharding, a sampler is required, right? For multiprocessing, it's kind of like automatically assigned by data loader. But for distributed training, a uh, distributed sampler has to be provided. And in order to create this distributed sampler, you have to retrieve all the distributed information, manually set C, and in order to advance to the next state per epoch, you have to call in set epoch to, to this, <coughs> sorry, to this sampler again and again which kind of like annoying for people and people complain about it. We want to solve this problem. Next slide, please. Then uh, when an uh, iterable uh, data set is used, we call it iterable data set, apparently, like the sampler is not supported, right? So if they say there's no way for you to do some in-place replacement or sampler to achieve different uh, sampling strategy for iterable data set. And 
for when you talk when we talk about distributed training, iterable data set mm, doesn't have this solution yet. You have to write your own customized uh, sharding determinism setting uh, code in your uh, iterable data set instance uh, class. So, so which is kind of like there's which made us uh, another thing I want to mention like Kevin talk about uh, Eater data pipe gonna be a first class citizen because we want to have more support on streaming large data set. So if we don't provide a solution for a user to how to do the sharding and shuffling over iterable data set, it's going to be a major problem for us. So that's also one thing we want to uh, resolve. Next slide, please. So in let's talk about uh, what, what we are proposing for data loader 2 regarding sharding and determinism. So this, uh, TL, TLDR is going to be for sharding. Data Loader 2 will do all the multi-processing or distributed sharding for, for you automatically. You don't need to, uh, you don't necessarily need to write any customized implementation of the data set or provide different samplers. And second, you don't need to rely on sampler to control the order of data. You can specify where you want to do the shuffle in the, in the data pipe graph. So, and then the loader tool will handle the ra randomness directly. Let's, let's look into more detail on it. Uh, here is going to be an example when, when you are using data loader tool. First, you create a data pipeline. Then based on your need, you create different reading services. For example, distributed reading service or multi-processing. Then just, just provide the reading service to the data loader tool. You can, you can load data automatically. You don't need to write all those like manual sharding and determinism setting code in your in your class in your class implementation or in your script. I, we feel like this is going to provide the most convenient way for user to write their code by swapping different reading service with the same data pipeline. Next slide, please. Okay, we we just talked about the user facing API. Let's dive a little bit deeper about how we achieve those features. First, for the use case of multi-processing training, data loader two will do definitely do the similar job as data loader one to launch multiple worker process or child processes. So in, uh, in each child process, uh, it will be one new replica of data pipe graph. And then a uh, multi-processing reading service will go through every single data pipe within each graph, within each replica to find the sharding operations and then apply this sharding strategy to those data pipes. Uh, I'm highlighting using auto sharding because the reading service is gonna set the sharding information to this data pipe to help you to do the sharding automatically. Then by doing that, you won't see any duplication, duplicated data across those multi-processing worker. Next slide, please. Okay, then regarding determinism, multi-processing reading service will also, will go through the each replica of data pipe again to find all the random operations and assign the corresponding seed based on the, based on a seed generator created by data loader two. So, so, so data loader 2 gonna be our single source of truth of all the randomness. The multi-processing reading service gonna handle how to set the seed based on the seed generator accordingly. And I want to call a small note regarding uh, why I talk about determinism and sharding together. So in the most of use cases, we want to have all the data shards mutually exclusive and collectively exhausted. So before the sharding, which means before any sharding operation, we need to make sure the order of data should be the same across all the workers, which means for multi-processing reading service, it has to find all the random operations before sharding and, and be, and in each replica of data pipe, 
it will synchronize the random state of all those random data, data type operations. Yeah, next slide, please. Let's move over to the distributed training use cases. First, this when we when we use distributed reading service, a special data pipe called FuSync will be attached to the end of the, the pipeline for each distributed node. What this data pipe is doing is it's gonna synchronize across all distributed nodes and exit whenever a distributed run just runs out of data. Why we need that? <laughs> so this is this was a common problem previously in distributed training in PyTorch. Like when all the distributed uh, when not all the distributed runs have the same length of data. When when we're calling distributed all reduce, the the program gonna hang because there there will be at least one distributed run is short of data. So that's why we are, we're gonna help you to prevent this scenario by this data pipe. It will automatically attach to the graph. So you don't need to worry about this and even data shard problem in the future. Next slide, please. Okay. Uh, similar to multi-processing reading service, distributed reading service will also go through all replica of data pipe graph across like distributed node, distributed nodes and distributed multi-processing workers. And it will apply distributed sharding to those uh, replica to guarantee also no duplicated data across those distributed workers. Yeah. Next slide. And the last uh, feature or, yeah, the last feature we provide with our distributed reading service is like I said, we need to have a way to synchronize our random states before sharding. So this distributed reading service will help help you to do that. So basically, it will use all, all the PyTorch distributed call, calls to, to make sure all the C generators across the loader tool gonna have the same random states, which will help us to make sure all the data shards are mutually exclusive and collectively exhausted. That's end of my uh, part on Dealer Two, uh, and let me hand over back to Kevin about performance. You are muted. Kevin, you're muted. Thank you. Uh, before we go into our demo, we want to briefly talk about the performance of Data Loader Two and data pipes. Overall, I think users can expect a similar level of performance as data loader with some improvements. One improvement is that we made some changes to the prefetching mechanism. Users can now, data loader can now prefetch at the worker level instead of only in the main process as it was in the old data loader. Um, this allows data loader workers to execute certain expensive operations such as like opening network connections in advance instead of waiting for the main process to ask for a sample and then do it. Another improvement that we made is by introducing data pipes, we allow loading data easily from archive files. Overall, by loading data from archive files like tar archives, it reduced the number of IO per second operations that is required. It also allows sequential reading from disk. And our internal benchmark shows that loading data from archives performs significantly better than loading individual files, such as individual images, especially on slower network drive. Overall, we also expect the data loader to new implementation to be slightly faster as well. Another metric that we're interested in is to compare the performance of data loading from a local disk versus a remote source, such as AWS S3, or it can be any other cloud storage. 
There are a few built-in data pipes that simplify the process of loading data from cloud storage. Notably, there's S3 file loader that allows you to load data from S3. We also provide similar solution for Google Cloud and Azure. We have a TAR archive reader that allows you to load archives of images or anything else rather than individual images. And that reduces the network IOPS required to transfer file. We also introduced the prefetcher as a data pipe, and it allows you to do some expensive operation ahead of time, such as establishing network connection. And with these data pipes, we create a benchmark to compare the performance of loading files locally versus on AWS S3. So the setup is that we have an AWS EC2 instance with a GP2 volume disk attached to it. We have a simple data pipeline that loads the image data from TAR archives, then performs some CPU-based transformation onto each image. And we pick transformation that approximates what users would typically apply to the images prior to training. And the result is that the throughput of loading data from local disk versus from S3 is pretty comparable. The remote solution is only slightly slower than a local one, especially when the transformation complexity is high for individual images. We have a reproducible benchmark script on our GitHub for your reference, and more details about the setup is also there. Yeah, I just wanted to draw your attention to, I, I just shared a link in the chat uh, to that benchmark script. So if you're curious and you'd like to see, you know, and follow through and, and how they they did the tests, um, you can click that link and check it out on on GitHub. Um, also, I just wanted to call out if you go back a, a slide, I think it's really cool that the 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 graph like like look at that like local versus S three like those are pretty close and like you know that's pretty amazing to be able to like get you know nothing can beat local just because it's on your local system but like that line is incredibly close to to to, to local. So um, I think that's an amazing testament to just how, you know, like good you got like that loading to take place, you know, through S3 and that's that's through the web. Like that's there's a lot of o extra overhead there, but it's it's pretty darn close. Yeah. Um, so with that, we're going to um, give a demo, quick demo to showcase how um, Torch data works. Um, for this demo, we're going to load a text data set called Squad, stands for Stanford Question Answering Data Set. Um, we will provide a link to the Code Lab notebook, and it will showcase how we load data using data pipes and data loader too in multiprocessing and distributed setting. I will switch over yep. to the notebook right now. And I'm, I just shared the link <clears throat> to the Code Lab notebook. Uh... And for those of you who are following along on LinkedIn, I'm going to go ahead and drop it in the chat over there. Um, so bear with me for a second, but you'll have it shortly. Okay, great. It's been shared in both places. And I need to re add that to the stream. Here we go. Yeah. So this is the Cult Lab notebook that we have, you can find the link in the chat. If We also have a link in on our GitHub readme. Um, so if you go to on github.com slash pytorch slash data, you can find our repo and there's a link on there as well. And so first of all, for Torch data, we offer two types of releases. One, we, we have the nightly releases that is published almost every single day and it provides the latest prototype copy of um, Torch data. And then we have the regular official releases. The Torch data releases are all lined up with PyTorch cores releases. So um, when the next PyTorch 2.0 release comes out, we, Torch data will also release a new version of, as well. If you're using Torch data and PyTorch on Code Lab, you might have to run these um, commands in order to install Torch data on Code Lab. But if you can also download this notebook as a Jupyter notebook or as a Python script and run Torch data and run the script locally as well. 
So the squat data set is a reading comprehension data set consisting of questions posed by crowd workers on a set of Wikipedia articles where the answers to every single question is a segment of text or span from the corresponding reading passage or the question might be unanswerable. This data set is hosted on a third party repo on GitHub and you can download that from there. So first, as you do in data loading, we typically have some metadata that we care about. In this case, um, we have the URL or the download link here. We have like the MD5 hash of the file, and then also some metadata about the number of lines within this file, each file. So we will start off by showing you how to load data with built-in data pipes provided by Torch Data. Um, but first, we'll need to create some, um, define some basic um, parameters, such as like where do you want to start a file, store in root, um, which copy of the data do you want? In this case, you want training. Um, we also have some helper function here for us to define the file path properly when we download it. Uh, so in this case, for the squat data set, its format is particular in some ways. So we need a custom iter, iter data type to parse for it. Um, so this is a custom implementation of iter data type. As you can see, um, it accepts some JSON data and parse for it based on how the data is laid out in this, for this particular data set. Um, but um, we'll use this later along with our built-in data pipes. So let's say you have downloaded the data ahead of time. You can simply load the data and parse them with built-in data pipe like this. So first, we um, put a wrapper around the file path. Um, we open it, we parse the JSON file. Then we have this custom parsing that we implement here called read squad. And so we can um, read the parse through this particular data set with this. After that, you can shuffle it then you can apply sharding onto it. You can also provide some other transformation such as mapping and filtering afterwards based on what you need. Uh, but this is basically all the minimal steps that you need to load your data. As you can see, most of these things are built in. The only custom implementation here is this, this read squad data pipe because um, the data set has some particular format that is not shared with other data set, and so you might need a custom parser to go through it. But everything else, Torch data, built-in data pipe can handle. So for a more advanced use case, you can also download or stream the source file and cache them before the rest of preprocessing steps happens. So in this case, um, we added two parts here. One is called um, on disk cache. So what ha what's happening here is that we are caching the download JSON files into a specified location. And, and then we also have an HTTP reader to re-download the data um, before the rest of the steps happen. Then after that, everything remains the same. You still open the file, you still parse the JSON and parse the data set. The only thing that you need to add is like two additional data pipe here in order to cache and download the data if you don't have it ahead of time. After you have this implementation, you can quickly do a sanity check to make sure the result is correct. Um, if you run this, you will get that the first line shuffle line from the data set. When the data pipeline is ready, we can pass into data loader to with a reading service. So the reading service that we typically use is called prototype multiprocessing reading service. It's function similarly to multiprocessing provided by both data loader in PyTorch. Aside from some internal features improvement, um, such as prefetching that will help our performance, um, overall the using, usage experience should feel about the same. So in this case, we import data loader two, we import the multiprocessing reading service, and then we create a data pipe, and then we pass in the data loader two and pass the reading service in, and then you're ready to go. And, you are now be able to iterate through data loader too and print out, um, return the process 
data. Let's say you want to do distributed training instead of local multiprocessing. Um, it's only a few steps away. You can import the necessary distributed libraries uh, and then um, such as the socket and set the master address and master port. Then you can just import distributed reading service and um, and run distributing training as such by replacing um, multi-processing reading service with distributed reading service. So this is what the distributed training script looks like. It just requires a little bit more additional steps. Um, in the case where there's some cases where um, you might have to pick a different multi-processing method if you're running it in cold lab versus locally, but overall, um, this will work and you should be able to um, receive data from two nodes and, and run distributed training this way. I think that mostly concludes our demo. Um, Justin? I forgot to unmute myself. <laughs> yeah, thanks for, for running through this. Uh, for those of you in, in the chat, I uh, shared the link out, and I also tried to share out a few uh, relevant documentation items that were, um, you know, as you were talking, Kevin. So hopefully those things also help people as they're going through and trying to dive deeper into um, data loading and data pipelines. Uh, pipelines. <clears throat> um, uh, there was a question that somebody asked um, about this recording and or about the stream and if there was going to be a recording made available. And yes, uh, the this video will be available immediately after the stream is over on YouTube. So if you go to YouTube and you go to the PyTorch uh, channel, which is just PyTorch, uh, and you click on uh, live, it will appear there. Um, and you'll also be able to see our upcoming live streams as well. In fact, there's another PyTorch 2.0 live Q&A taking place tomorrow. Uh, February 2nd, uh, and I think that one's at 2 p.m. Pacific time. So um, so yes, uh, all of these streams are recorded and available for watching afterward. So just wanted to um, um, you know, call that out. Uh, we also had another question um, from somebody on uh, LinkedIn. Um, they basically uh, wanted to know uh, some best practices for data loaders. So I'll read their question. Um, so excited to hear anything on best practices for data loaders at inter uh, inference. Uh, perhaps some insights on how to best use in combination with torch script models and or with inference engine options, uh, managing num workers to give optimal throughput without getting GPU OOMs has always been a challenge. Yeah, uh, that's a good, great question. And we, that's kind of align with our architecture of data loader too. So if you imagine you have pipeline of all the map functions or map data pipe operations, you want you always want to do some optimization for inference, right? You can you can have your own customized reading service to go through this graph of data pipe to figure out like you can combine multiple map functions together you to convert and convert it to your Tor script. And that might help your like inference. And talking about GPU, GPU problem, we are actively uh, like thinking about how to make sure basically guard users from like creating GPU contexts in multiple uh, worker processes, which normally the, the, the root cause of GPU auto memory issue. So basically we, 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 we kind of like, we're still like actively researching on how to do give you the optimal kind of like user experience. We, we know the solution, but we want to give you the best like user interface to make it happen for, for, for your pipeline creation. Yeah, and that that's an important point, right? Just having a solution might be great, but if it's hard to use, if it's not a great user experience, adoption will be low. So um, it's great that you're trying to come up with and think of um, you know the best way how to, how to do that. Um, if, if people want to be involved in that process, I know that uh, PyTorch is an open source project. So, um, you know, do you have any like direction or tips that you would give to people who are interested in wanting to get started with contributing to, to PyTorch? Yeah, absolutely. Um, we'll go over that in just a second. Um, but overall, we sure. welcome PyTorch contributors on our GitHub. Um, you can 
uh, talk about, discuss any issue by opening a GitHub issue on our repository. You can also ask a question on PyTorch forum in the section called data. Um, we also mark some features as like good first issue for people who want to get started with contributing. But we are also happy to hear any additional features that you would like, and we accept pull requests as well. Great, yeah, and you know this ties into uh, Urjo was talking about some of the the future um, plans, and so this this ties right into your next part of of your talk, Kevin. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, bring the the uh, oops uh, slides back up, uh, and we're talking about future plans. <laughs> yeah, um, thank you, Justin. Overall, we want to make. Um, we have a few things that we, that we're working on here at Torch Data. Um, the first thing is we would like to graduate our prototype multiprocessing reading service from from prototype to data to provide more stable API and more complete features. It will, this will happen in the next couple of weeks. And there are also other features that we're working in progress, such as like the checkpointing and resuming feature. This allows you to basically save the state of your data loading uh, and then restore that later. To start with, we're going to allow users to save the state of data loading at the beginning of the epoch that they can restore later. Then we also plan to provide more flexible and arbitrary checkpointing in the middle of an epoch. And overall, we think this will provide more fault tolerance to the data loading process. And if anything went wrong with your training or your hardware, you are able to restore most of the work that you have lost rather than having to start from the beginning. Then another feature that we're working on is called sequential reading service. Basically, it allows you to use multiple reading services at the same time. Perhaps you can use a custom implemented reading service with the multiprocessing reading service that we provide. Another feature is multi-threading support. We plan to integrate a async I.O. to accelerate the I.O. bound data related data pipelines. And finally, we would like to decouple Torch data from PyTorch more. Um, it will not affect how necessarily affect how users use Torch data, but it will we want to remove the hard dependency without impacting any functionality. There are a lot of developer benefits that we can think of um, for on our side, and it will be easier for new contributors to contribute and us to um, publish new packages in the future if we are able to do this. Um, as I mentioned before, um, Torch Data welcome community contribution. We are actively looking for feedback and new contributors. Please check out our, check out our GitHub repo and documentation. If you have potential use cases and you're not sure if Torch Data can support it, we are happy to hear it and discuss about it. So here are some resources to our GitHub, github.com slash PyTorch slash data. Feel free to open any issue, request any features and contribute. Our documentation is on pytorch.org slash data. And then finally on PyTorch forum, we're happy to answer any data loading required data usage questions on there. And now we'll take any questions that people may have. Justin. Yes. So if you have any further questions, please uh, drop them in the chat. We got about 10 minutes left. So um, yeah, ask away. Don't be shy. Um, and um, I'm going to also drop a link into uh, the chat here. Um, you know, some of those links that you, uh, if you bring back that other slide, Kevin, um, that way people can see, you know, the different things that you shared out. But I'm going to drop a link to the, the PyTorch forum in, in the chat. So you will just click on that. But yeah, if you have any further questions that we're unable to answer today, um, or, you know, maybe it's something that, you know, you need to write, you know, a ton about, um, you know, and you need a little bit of time, you can go to the PyTorch form and, and um, type it up and ask there. But um, yeah, please feel free to, to ask any questions while you have both Kevin and uh, Urja on the line here to ask, uh, uh, to, to provide those answers. So, um, give you a few moments to, to ask a few questions. Um, uh, but I, I'll, you know, I have a couple questions um, for, for you two. Um, you know, one of the things we were, you were talking about, um, 
you know, when you were talking about like map data pipes and uh, the iter data pipe, um, I was just curious, like, why are there fewer of the map data pipes than the uh, iter data pipes? I can take this one first. Um, overall, uh, we basically, we want to avoid implementing a lot of functionality twice. For example, um, opening file, you can do it as easily on either data pipe as it is on map data pipe and so does many other operations. So there isn't really a functional need for you to, for us to create like the same functionality twice. So that is from like the developer perspective. And then second of all, we also provide a built-in converter for you to convert either data pipe to map data pipe or the other way around. So if you have a strong preference about using one style over the other, you can use our converter. And that would allow you to basically have the same set of functionality throughout. I see. So, um, oh yeah, sorry, Urjo, were you gonna yeah. say something? Yeah, no problem. I will add one more point on top of Kevin's feedback. We, if you imagine uh, index-based uh, map data pipe, there's no order, right? You basically give it an index and it return your data. And normally when we do the ML training, we want to shuffle the shuffle the data to perform like better to get a better model, I guess. So when we, when we're talking about shuffle, it's kind of like natively change the behavior from map to iterable because map map doesn't have order, but iterable has to, has the order. So in that sense, we think eventually you a user want to convert the pipeline from map to iter. And then that's why we think we get by adding more operations over iter data pipe is kind of like provide more benefit for the most of users. Yeah, that's, that's my, my feeling on this question. I see. Great, thanks. Um, and then I had a question about just um, you know extending uh, you know the data pipe operations. Are there any like restrictions on top of the um, the iter function? Uh, I can answer that uh, first. Uh, I I feel like iter is gonna be the minimum requirement for you to implement your own iter data pipe. Uh, at least for now. <laughs> so as Kevin is currently actively working on the checkpointing feature, we might require you to add a certain like API to make your own data pipe can be supported by data layer two to give, give the kind of like state of this data pipe operation, which will help us to do the like arbitrary uh, checkpointing, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, there are also some other things that people might need to be aware of, such as like um, if you're using multi-processing, by default, your data pipe must be serializable. So those are built-in Python language limitations that um, you still have to abide by when you write your own custom data pipe. I see. So it must be serializable. Um... Cool. Um, so, um, you know, I wanted to, you know, call back to that slide that you showed with the the um, the timing and you know showing the difference between local and uh, S three. And I thought it was pretty impressive that you were able to get those both pretty close to to, to one another. Um, you know, I, I was wondering how archives uh, affect uh, performance. Um, is there anything that you can share there? when using uh, and benchmarking results with archives? Yeah, overall, we think um, loading data from archives uh, is definitely better than loading individual files. Let's say an archive, loading an archive of Im images is better than loading individual images of files. Um, it might not matter if you have a really, really fast local solid state drive. But in most cases, if you are loading data from a network, then it, it becomes really, really important for you to um, reduce the number of IOPS operations you have um, and make um, packaging these data into archives, which is just going to help a lot with that. And it also allows 
sequential reading on, on this and so on. So there are a bunch of um, great um, benefits that you get from loading archives instead of loading individual files. Right. So if you had like a bunch of different files that were all remote through S3 and you had to basically load them all, that's all, those are all separate basically get requests that then you have to then join up all that data together. And like you said, you don't get the sequential reads. So I think, you know, is it safe to assume with that benchmarking? And I, I know that you shared the code for that, um, but I'll admit I haven't gone through it line by line. Um, you know, would, uh, you know, is it safe to say that in that benchmark you were using archives uh, for that yes. test? Yes. Yeah. Um, and I think it's also worth mentioning that molding individual files from certain cloud service provider can be expensive because um, you are charged per request. Um, right. So that should be part of your consideration as well. Yeah, no, that's that's a good point. Like cost, that's no one wants to think of that, but it's very important <laughs> when the bill comes due. So um, yes, <laughs> especially in the production environment too. So um, cool. And then you know you're talking about like you know creating pipelines, and you know we provided a bunch of different documentation here and there um, throughout the presentation. Um, you know, is there any examples that you can share about like creating pipelines and, you know, um, yeah, I'm excited to see anything that you can share. Oh uh, yeah, we, we have, uh, we have multiple places having examples. Uh, the first place is going to be on our GitHub repo. There's a directory called examples and we have a bunch of examples including audio tags and some other domains. <laughs> and we also okay. have uh, like a few, a certain links on our PyTorch online doc, like they say pytorch.org slash data. There's a page called examples. It should be like, we, we have been collaborating with all different kind of like vendors or or different domains, they have created lots of examples based on Torch Data's data pipe solution. So it's, yeah, please check it out and feel free to comment on our like open issue if you, you want to have like different examples on different domains, we can figure out how to provide support to you. Okay, yes, thank you. I found the link on pytorch.org for the data examples and I'll drop that in the chat. I'm not quite sure where the examples were on GitHub. So was it pytorch slash data? Uh, py examples? GitHub pytorch yeah, slash data. Yeah, yeah, there's a there's... example folder. In... Oh, I see, I'm in pytorch slash pytorch. I need to go to data. Good. Uh, and then here's examples. Great. So I'll drop these two links in the chat for everyone so you can have access to it. It's, and yes, there's a data loader two folder uh, in the uh, PyTorch repository. So if you go to GitHub PyTorch uh, slash data, then go to examples, and then there's data loader two. So I'll drop both of these links in the chats so people can uh, see what we're talking about, the different examples that are available. And once I have done that, um, we're at time. So hang on just a sec. I can't walk and chew gum at the same time. <laughs> All right, great. So <laughs> just want to say, uh, Kevin and Urja, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for being here today. Um, and uh, thank you all who tuned in to watch us live. Um, thank you for your questions. Uh, be sure, if you're not already doing so, to follow us on um, uh, all the different social media channels. So uh, if you go to uh, twitter.com slash PyTorch, you can see all of the latest and greatest information regarding PyTorch, including uh, when we'll next go live. Um, for those of you who are watching on LinkedIn, uh, you know, again, I just want to remind you that the recordings for this will be available immediately after the stream on YouTube. So you can watch on demand. If there's anything that you missed or you want to come back and watch, you can definitely put it on 2x speed and just blitz through the whole presentation and, and get to the spots that you want to uh, extract information from. And um, yeah, Kevin, uh, 
Urja, uh, if there's anything you want to say, you know, where do people follow you, you know, share your, your social media handles if you'd like, uh, please do so now. You can star our GitHub repository. You can <laughs> help make contributions. Um, but I think also make sure to follow PyTorch on LinkedIn on Twitter. Um, that's it from me. Yeah, uh, glad everyone joined this Q and A session. We're looking forward to any contributor to Torch Data. <laughs> and yeah. yeah, we we have we have attached our social media handles in our post. So feel free to ping me anytime for any yeah. question. Absolutely. Thank you guys. Thank you so Justin. much for joining. Great. Yeah. And would you say that Twitter is the best place to reach out to you? Or you know, would it be GitHub, the forums? What what's the what's the direct line of contact for you? Oh yeah. <laughs> where, uh, where, where do you want people to like, talk to you? Yeah, for torch data related, please reach out us to Get GitHub up. or forum. We are All right. activate monitoring. All right, yeah. So GitHub, start those repositories and uh, yeah, reach out on the forum. So all right. Well, thank you all for tuning in. And uh, this was, uh, well, I'm Justin Jeffers, and we're signing off for PyTorch uh, 2.0 live Q&A on uh, Torch Data. And uh, catch you tomorrow uh, at uh, 2 p.m. Pacific time for our next talk. And that's going to be run by Shashank. So um, hope to see you all there tomorrow. All right. And we're out. <laughs>